first I remember sort of opening my eyes and being in this really bright white lit room. I didn't see any people except for these six really tall, bright white light beings that just sort of glowed. And maybe they were angels. I don't remember seeing wings, but they were very loving. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. We wanted to take a second and stop to thank you guys, the community. Lately, we've noticed something amazing in the comments. Many of you are helping each other through grief, and it's heartwarming to see this community come together, which is why we've partnered with today's sponsor, BetterHelp, the world's leading online therapy platform. BetterHelp connects you with licensed therapists who are trained to listen and provide valuable, unbiased advice and can help with a range of issues, including depression, grief, anxiety, relationships, trauma, and more. And by using the link in the video description, you not only support this channel, but also get 10% off your first month of therapy. With BetterHelp, you have the freedom to communicate the way you want, through text, call, or video. In most cases, you will be matched with a therapist within 48 hours or less and will have the flexibility to schedule sessions at your convenience and even switch therapists free of cost. If you've lost somebody or are going through a painful experience, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description for a 10% discount on your first month of therapy. Well, my near-death experience happened when I was 19. I had just graduated high school and was modeling and was needing to make some money. So I was working in some bars and not really sure what I was doing, you know, as just trying to figure things out. And I started working in an exotic dancer bar in a strip bar to make some money and to have the flexibility to be able to leave and go out and go on go sees for developing my career as a model. And after a little bit of time in that bar, it really started to wear on me and I was getting a little burned out on just even trying to date and doing that. And just the whole men, women thing was kind of driving me crazy. And so I started getting offers from clients to go on trips with them. And I really was like, I'm not going to go into the whole CD underground, you know, the whole prostitution thing. But I was getting really burned out on the whole situation and decided I would take a trip with a client. And I said, you know, I'm only, it's all in the up and up, nothing funky going on. Atlanta, it was to Atlanta. Atlanta was the up and coming hub for modeling at the time. So I thought, well, I'll go on some go sees. This guy just said he just wanted company. So it's just, you know, on the up and up that I'm going. And I went and I went on some go sees and I went and did some stuff. And then it became pretty clear that he had other intentions. And one evening he really pushed those intentions and I was able to sort of get away and he kind of let me out of the room and before anything really crossed my boundaries. But at that point, I fell asleep that night in the hotel room. My I had my own room and I was thinking about that and I was like, what am I doing? You know, here I am 19 trying to get my life together and I'm doing this crazy stuff. You know, how far am I going to go with this? And I really had a feeling that if I kept pushing this whole fringe lifestyle, this kind of fringe of, of prostitution, fringe of, you know, uh, sexuality and all of that lifestyle that I would cross some boundaries that I had and maybe even cause some soul damage. And I was really pondering this as I fell asleep that night in the hotel room. And I started thinking because I had another trip lined up oh, on Christmas Day to see a Chiefs game in Minnesota. I had never been to a football game and I thought, okay, the customer had invited me to that one. And that one felt a little safer. It was a friend of the bar owner, but you know, how safe is that? <laughs> I was thinking about this next coming trip and I saw myself getting in the car, but not getting to the airport. And I thought, this is so weird. Why can't I even imagine myself going there? And so I fell asleep that night in this hotel room with this crazy situation I was in, pondering all this. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, oh, I'm going to be in a car wreck and it's going to be a miracle if I survive. And at that moment, I kind of shut it down and I thought, oh, you're going to self-fulfilling prophecy. Don't don't even manifest something like that. And I pushed myself to go back to sleep. But then flash forward a couple months later to Christmas Day. And I had moved home with my parents because I was trying to kind of get my life back together and maybe leave the bar, maybe go back to school or do something like that. And I was living with them and we got up in the morning on Christmas Day and we opened our gifts and we had our meals and we had this wonderful little family thing that we do. And then my parents and my brother left to go to my grandparents' house. And I went upstairs to take a nap because I was tired. And I had to leave for later that day for the airport. And then when I woke up, I woke up late and I hadn't even packed. I remember, I remember throwing everything into the suitcase and rushing out the door and jumping in my car. I had this Dodge Colt Vista, this kind of 
boxy cross between a minivan. And I jumped in the car and I drove through town. It was a small Kansas town, Ottawa, Kansas. And I drove through the town and I got up on the highway. And I remember that I was wearing a seatbelt, although they weren't like necessary to wear them at that time. It just, I had been having this intuition that I needed to wear my seatbelt for the last probably two weeks before this. So I had my seatbelt on and I got on the highway and I remember I looking at the speedometer and I was going about 70 miles an hour. And at the time, the speed limit was 65 and I was going over a bridge and I was passing a car and I thought, okay, I need to pick up the phone and call this guy and tell him I'm on my way. I might be a little bit late, but I'm going to be there. So phones back then were like little bags. They were like little briefcase bags in it had actually a receiver and it plugged into your cigarette lighter. Very first cell phones. And I had one and it was in the floorboard of the passenger side of my car. And I remember thinking, okay, I need to pick up, you know, take off my seatbelt and pick up this phone and plug it in and call this guy. But I was, you know, let me just go over this bridge and pass this car and then I'll do that. And I was rushing and rushing. And I remember going over the bridge and I was almost past the car and I took off my seatbelt and I bent over to pick up the phone. And as I came up, I came close to hitting the car I was passing. So I swerved to miss and my car nosedived into the median. Now, it's not exactly, I'm not totally clear on everything that happened, but I know that I I swerved to miss and I overcorrected and then I kind of fishtailed. When I came out of the coma, I actually thought that I had pulled over and stopped to catch my breath and then continued on my way. But what what really happened was that my car nosedived into the median and now Kansas highways are, there's two lanes of traffic and then there's a big median that's about four lanes wide of grass and then there's two lanes on the other side going the other direction of the highway so my car nose dived into the median then it flipped end over end over end over end across that entire median then across the other two lanes of traffic and they found me about 40 feet from the car chased down and turning blue what i discovered was that the car behind me was a nurse and the next car from the other direction was also a nurse. So, thank God, there was some divine order in play at that time. And they are the ones who told me what had happened, what they saw, like the Indy 500, she said. And this was some time later, actually, that I met them and they told me this. This one nurse, basically, I was unconscious and she just tried to hold my airway open as best she could until the ambulance came. They ambulanced me to Ottawa, to Ransom Memorial Hospital in Ottawa, Kansas, which was just outside of where I, the wreck was. That's where I was coming from because there was a trauma doctor who was starting a unit there and she was only there twice a month and she happened to be there that day. Otherwise, they would have taken the extra 20 minutes to ambulance me to Overland Park and I probably wouldn't have made it, they said. And then when they got me to Ottawa, they life flighted me to Kansas City and I spent a month in a coma at the hospital there. And then they transferred me from there to a neurological hospital in Gardner to Meadowbrook Hospital. It was said that it would take four to six months for me to rehab enough to get out of the hospital and that they told my parents not to expect me to ever live on my own again, be able to go back to school, to be even functioning, that I would always probably need assistance because I had head injuries. I fractured six ribs, four front and back, punctured a lung, ruptured my spleen, cracked my pelvis, I broke my chin off. I have metal plates in my face now and probably a lot of other stuff that I forget um, to mention. So that's kind of what happened on this side of things. But for me, what I remember is first I remember sort of opening my eyes and being in this really bright white lit room. I didn't see any people except for these six really tall, bright white light beings that just sort of glowed and Maybe they were angels. I don't remember seeing wings, but they were very loving and very tall and very bright. And they slid their hands under me and they lifted me up to sit up. And I realized I was sort of coming up out of a body and standing in the room with them. And it was like, 
real family, you know, like the family we talk about without the baggage, you know, there's total love. Everything's okay. It's total unconditional. Like there's nothing that I've done wrong. I mean, no matter what I thought, I mean, you know, not long before the accident, I was telling my friend after a long night at the bar, you know, I know I came here for a reason and for a mission, but I'm really tired. And this place, this earth stuff is it's hard. And I think I reneged my mission. I'm not going to do anything, but you know, I'm ready if it's time. And here was the opportunity. And these beings were so full of love and guidance and compassion. And they showed me what I had come to do, what I'd done up to that point. And I, I really saw how even my actions and my words had hurt other people, especially my friend. There was a good friend I had, Patrick, who was my best friend, but also, you know, wanted to be more than that. And I would never give him the time of day to make it more. And I was kind of sassy. And I just really saw how my actions had really hurt him and others. But that's the person who really sticks in my mind. So they showed me, you know, okay, this is what you've done up to this point, And this is what's possible from here on out. And that it was still possible. And, and for a long time, I felt like I didn't really have a choice. But over time, I've come to understand that, yeah, I, I did have a choice. But a lot of my time on the other side was spent really understanding, trying to make amends with what I was experiencing there and what was going on over here. So I do remember one instance where I was looking down on my hospital bed from the corner of the room and seeing my mom there just like holding me and feeling sorrow and the heaviness of what I had done. And, you know, before when I had said I was ready to go, I had said, oh, you know, it'll hurt some people in my family and stuff, but they'll get over it. And then, you know, with seeing her there, I realized you don't get over that. It doesn't heal. And then the next memory I really have is being in the circle of these beings and they were all debating whether I should go or stay. There was like 12 of them. And, you know, I understood it was like, are we going to do a replacement? Someone going to take her place like a walk-in sort of thing? Are we going to send her back? Are we just going to scrap this mission? And I just felt like for a long time that I didn't have a choice in that matter, that I just had to wait, you know, because they had also showed me everything is so connected. It's like looking out of an airplane at the city at night and like how all the lights of the city are there. And imagine that each one is connected to the others. And when a power surge happens, it like dims the light, but it one light goes out, but it affects all the lights around them. And I understood that if my light went out, just like each of us, that it's going to affect so many people. And then even after coming out of the coma, my mom had saved all the cards and prayer grams from churches and stuff that people had sent me. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cards, but hundreds of prayer grams from churches. People wrote these wishes to these prayers for me that I didn't even know. And just thinking about how that affects every single one of those people who put energy into bringing me back. It's pretty amazing and humbling. And so I remember realizing how much my light, just like each of us, affects everything and everyone else and that it does have this purpose. And in the center of these beings, while they were debating whether to go or stay, and then my next memories are really kind of coming back into the body. So coming back into the body is not easy. It takes a lot of effort to get in body. So every one of you that's in a body, I know you think it's effortless, but bravo for staying in because it's not easy. I remember one time waking up and I remember seeing my friend Patrick there because they would only let a few people in at a time, two or three people for half an hour, two or three times a day. Although I think at this time it was several weeks in and I'd moved to a more intermediate care. However, people were not able to come in that often. But because my family basically camped out in the waiting room just to wait for those few moments, they were there for weeks on end, they kind of made some exceptions and let him in. And at this time, Patrick was in there and he was, I opened my eyes and saw him and he was kind of dozing and I remember just trying to will him awake wake up wake up wake up and then he opened his eyes and I and he said oh Shana you're awake and I kind of mumbled something and I think he thought I wanted to know what happened and so he started telling me and I don't remember what he said but what I do remember is how that love fabric that I experienced on the other side this 
I call it pregnant potentiality, where it's like the fabric of everything that everything rests on. It's like what the Chinese medicine calls the ethers. It's like the air. It's like the substance that we exist in, like the water that the fish lives in, that we live in. And it's all love and it's all made of love. And it all comes from that. And we come from that. And just feeling that as I was watching him speak to me and I could see that that's here too. And that this idea of there and here is such an illusion that it's only a perspective shift away. And that I looked at him and I could see in his eyes that he was not unlike those beings on the other side that were so full of love and truth that you can see it in the eyes. It's that awareness. And I could see in his eyes that he too was full of light. And even after coming back from the coma, I could see that in people. You can still see it in people, you know, that that's where the light is. And I realized that there is here that love the truth of it it's just hard to see it sometimes with our minds illusions that it creates and then you know I couldn't hold it anymore at that moment I kind of fell back I call it falling back it's like you just sort of fall backwards into this unconscious space I don't really remember waking up too much until they transferred me to the neurological hospital. I have some memories of, you know, being awake in the ambulance as they took me to the new hospital. And then once I got to the new hospital, I remember getting in the, they put me in this hot tub and it was the first time I'd had a hot bath for months because I had too many tubes coming out me and couldn't put anything but a sponge on me. And so that's when I really start to remember waking up. But from that point on, you know, I mean, one thing when I first came back, I knew was that I was here to help people heal and I wanted to help them find their way home back to that awareness that I had. And I, I started to talk to about my experience on the other side. I first started to share about this circle of beings, that last memory I had. And I remember that I shared it with my dad, you know, as an engineer and very rational guy. And he said, oh, you know, I think there was a television, like a courtroom television show on, on the TV. And you probably just took that into your dreams. And I remember just that idea was so shocking to me because what I had experienced felt more real than real. It had such emotion to it and such vibrancy in the colors and so real that the idea that this was a dream or my imagination or not real was too overwhelming to even take in. And so I really shut down around a lot of my memories and kind of held them like a little nugget inside and didn't really talk about them. However, everything in me was, what was that? I know it's here. How do I find it? And my search has been for that since then. And it has led me to living in France with lots of experiences over there that have unraveled and uncovered, you know, how to follow the light, how to know when expansion guides you and use that to lead you. But what happened was that, you know, when I shut down after that experience and kind of nuggeted around all of these woo-woo part of it, people could take in this miraculous recovery I had. So I mostly just talked about that. And right after the accident, you know, I got out of the hospital in February and by August I was back in school and driving <laughs> and um, living on my own again. At first, after coming out of the coma, you know, it was total bliss. I was totally, I saw the love, I saw the light. Grass was like incredible. The vibrancy and the life force that comes up from grass and the plants and the trees on the planet, just incredible. And I was so sensitive and so, I mean, felt everything so fully. It was like every boundary, every filter was just gone and everything was raw and pure, but so was the harshness that we do. And that was really overwhelming for me. Just, I would cry for hours at just the way people treat each other in like, you know, war and who talks someone who would cuss someone out at the grocery store would just ugh, be like daggers. And it was really challenging. And I started to go after a couple of years of this through a bit of a depression and having some suicidal thoughts, which did not make sense. I couldn't do that to my family after all we'd been through. So I started journaling and I would journal and just sort of start automatic writing, just whatever's coming out of my head, just go and go and go and go. And then afterwards I'd read it, but I would notice that I'd ask questions and somehow something would answer these questions and 
I'm like, how did I know that? Like, where did that come from? And eventually that's how I started communicating with the council that I met on the other side. That's who I call those light beings from this side. And for years, they were my confidants and my guides. Um, and they led me to discovering massage therapy, which really helped me get out of that depression. I felt like I was finally on my right path. And then I began my healing practice. This was in 96, so three years after the coma and our uh, two and a half. And I began my practice as a massage therapist and grace of God and some serendipity. And it took off right away. And, you know, the intuitive work would always come in. They'd tell me stuff and I'm like, I can't tell them that. I'm not going to say that to them. I'm not going to ask them that. But it would bug me so much that I finally have to just say, you know, hey, do you know anybody named Jason or whatever, you know, and then it would unfold in these amazing healing situations for these people. And so that became my work. And I've been doing that for about 30 years. And about nine years ago, Spirit led us to California through a bunch of serendipity and unusual events. Much to my surprise, I thought we were coming for my husband and his spiritual teacher. And then we got here and the project we came for collapsed about six months after arriving. And then my business took off and people want to know about the intuitive work that I do. Never talked about it in Kansas. People just couldn't seem to take that part in, even though that's what they came for. Um, it just became word of mouth. Um, I never hung a shingle out about it. Then I did started to do that when I came to California, started actually speaking about my near-death experience. People were interested. In, and then here I am still, you know, now I'm working yeah, since COVID with people online at a distance through Zoom and through phone and also in person in Los Gatos and Santa Cruz and then offering my workshops. So that's kind of how it's all unfolded. Here we are, 30 year anniversary this year of it all. <laughs>